public meeting order. Welcome to all the visitors. We're here on this wintry day. Is there any uh, additions or changes to the uh, agenda? Uh, yeah, this it's not uh, an April Fool's joke. I do want to put concealed carry in schools on the uh, on the agenda. That would be item C or uh, item number one under section C. So we need to discuss. I entertain a motion to approve the item. Mr. President, I move the board approve the agenda. Second. Good motion. Move and second to approve the agenda as amended. We're in discussion. All in favor, right hand. By the same sign, seven up. Okay. Consent agenda. You have the minutes of the March 4th meeting, bills for payment, budget report, activity fund report. We're all emailed to you. Mr. President, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Been moved and second to approve the cons consent agenda. There any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Both same sign, said no. All right. <clears throat> First business item, or actually, is there any patrons that want to make comments at this time? Well, I'm denying that opportunity. All right. Let's move on to the first business item evaluation tools. <clears throat> Uh, if you remember the uh, No Child Left Behind uh, waiver that the State Department of Education submitted uh, required all school districts to change their evaluation system uh, to meet certain requirements. Uh, so we've been meeting and going through that uh, with teaching staff. Uh, Barb and Carolyn were on that committee, three administrators, and then we had five teachers uh, part of that committee. Uh, <coughs> So quickly, I want to review our current forms uh, that we utilize uh, for the, the high school here for tenured staff, uh, the four areas there, uh, kind of like what we have, uh, uh, what we're headed toward now as far as the areas, uh, and then uh, including an area for comments. Uh, the elementary form is here. You can see the uh, different areas of, that are evaluated uh, here, and then the, the rating scale. One thing you'll notice on, on neither form, um, which is pretty typical of, of a lot of school districts' forms and many educators have had uh, experience with, nothing says wh what, is a, what is a one compared to a four. If, if I would go in and evaluate the teacher, and my, uh, Mr. Bergen would evaluate the teacher, and Mrs. Seifke would evaluate the teacher, we may come up with a different number watching the same lesson. So a lot of what we're, we're headed toward is, is being a little more specific. Now these, this document has to fit certain guidelines. Uh, <coughs> we borrowed uh, this from Andover. Uh, with their permission, used a lot of their information. It outlines the purpose of the evaluation process, uh, and, and the idea there is uh, we're not just evaluating to say a teacher is a certain category, but we're looking for areas of improvement. No matter whether the teacher is, uh, is not a very good teacher or is an excellent teacher, everybody can improve. So that's the idea. This framework for teaching part uh, discusses the Charlotte Danielson's research, which this evaluation system is based on. The domains, the things that we're looking at uh, when evaluating a teacher would be those for planning and preparation, uh, classroom environment, the actual instruction that's taking place, and then the professional responsibilities, all those other things that, that go on. So when you think about going in to watch a teacher teach, it's tough to evaluate the planning or 
the professional responsibilities that domain one and domain four by just watching the lesson. You know, hopefully the planning is evident that you know they they planned and prepared properly, but it, it's really tough to see some of those things. Um, and then the the ratings: exemplary, proficient, basic, and unsatisfactory. And ladies, stop me if if you have anything to bring up. So. <clears throat> Same thing over here from the side table. Uh, overview of the procedures. This is, uh, some of this will have to go in our negotiated agreement. Uh, the evaluation procedures is no different than state statute is right now, and it's no different than what our current system is. We follow the statute. Uh, first two years uh, of employment in the <coughs> district, teachers are evaluated twice. Uh, once in the fall, once in the spring. During the third and fourth years, they're evaluated once a year by February 15th, and then fourth year and after, uh, it's just once every three years. Uh, this we would add a professional development plan for those teachers that may not be, uh, be evaluated in a particular year. So we still focus on improving everybody every year. This would be the process. I won't go through all of this, but it's Two observations, We're going to, the evaluator is going to sit down with the teacher, talk about the lesson, watch the lesson, and then meet afterwards uh, and, uh, and go through that process and there will be another observation. And you know, the, the principals would walk through the classrooms and periodically see what's going on. So uh, all of those things you know, go into the final evaluation. This outlines the plan of assistance. If a teacher receives an unsatisfactory rating, what's going to happen? And I'll show you the forms on that <coughs> uh, here. This would be uh, one of the forms that the teacher would go through with the evaluator to show uh, that first domain, the planning. What has gone into the planning? How do you know uh, where we're headed? Um, how do you... Uh, plan to know whether the kids learned it or not, and, and some of those things. So it would just be a conversation of uh, what's going to happen, uh, what do you want me to look for. Then this would be the observation form, all the content of watching the lesson, the instruction and in the classroom environment, making notes on what is observed. Then this would be given to the teacher as feedback. Then after the lesson, the teacher would reflect on the lesson, how did things go, how would I do it differently, and then the teacher submits artifacts. Uh, for example, lesson plans. Uh, it's hard to see how the lesson plan was made without just handing the document over, saying, this is what I do, uh, or this is how I communicate with parents. Here's a list, here's some letters and emails that I've sent to parents. So the teachers would have to submit something. Uh, this requires four things. One is the reflection form, what we just saw, and then three more. So they would pick on what, uh, like if uh, maybe the teacher got graded bad, poorly on, uh, on one category, communicating with families. So next evaluation they could say, here's what I've done to improve. Here's how I'm doing it better, uh, or something like that. So the teacher's going to have to submit some things. And then we give a list of all the different artifacts, the things that could be submitted. <clears throat> and then this would be the professional development plan. What are the goals for improvement? Again, this would be for the teachers that have been here more than three years. They're just evaluated every three years. So if they're not being evaluated, we still want them to be thinking about how am I going to improve and, and grow even though we're not being evaluated. And then this is one of the forms that if there's an unsatisfactory rating, uh, what is the area of improvement? How are we going to fix it? Uh, and then that leads us to the plan of intensive assistance. Everybody understands what's going to be expected. What is the area of improvement? What are we going to do to fix it? Uh, what are we going to be done with this plan? And then recommendations after the plan is completed. 
uh, we continue on, we move back to the regular cycle or continue with assist assistance or uh, improvement hasn't been made, it's, it's time to part ways. <clears throat> this would be the actual form that goes in the file, in the personnel file. <clears throat> all four domains in each category, uh, each component in each domain, and then comments, and then signatures. So that's what goes in the form. Uh, the feedback form, this is the rubric, which we were looking at the one earlier, how do you tell what's different between a one, two, three, four, five? Well, if we're looking at a rubric, we can tell domain 1A, demonstrating knowledge of content and pedagogy, what is unsatisfactory, what is basic, what is proficient, what is exemplary. Um, so for each domain, managing classroom procedures, what does that mean? They're not existent or they're inefficient, there's lots of lost instructional time. The next category, uh, you can see how that's worded. And Everybody can see what is exemplary, what's expected of me uh, to be the best I can be. So even though a teacher may be exemplary in almost every category, maybe one area they, they're not, we still want to see improvement. <coughs> so that goes through all four. Um, anything from the board's perspective? Well. Uh Oh, no, go ahead. You know, you, we, we met and talked about the idea of, of um, you characterizing some of the objective of this. Um, I think when you're not in the school system, sometimes when I think of job evaluations, I think of something that's going to um, be used for kind of promotion or merit-based increases. I, you, know, you start to realize we're not dealing in that realm. We're not even dealing in the realm usually of getting on top of a problem that, that leads to dismissal. We're, for the vast majority of time, talking about working with good teachers and trying to set a tone of excellence, and, and I think all of these, there were three different ones that we um, looked at as possibilities of systems, and they all three give so much more framework to the idea of how we give feedback to people and administratively how they kind of just set that tone for, for constant improvement and excellence. So. The state mandated thing, but it seems like a good thing to do no matter what. I think it's looking at what we've had in the past, and this does look like a lot when you're looking at it and things, but I do think it's a great tool that's going to help even the board, you know, when the administrator does their evaluation. It, they can report back to the board what they have done, what they have witnessed and things, and they actually have the documentation. And I think it'll make our job easier as far as what needs to be done too, as far as, far as the final decision and stuff. But I think it'll make the administrator's job a lot easier, knowing in black and white what, the, what they expect of their teachers, and the teachers will know what the administrator's going to expect of them. So. So I just think it's just <coughs> more efficiency though. I, I really don't think there's much different than the evaluation <coughs> tool that's currently been used other than this one has a rubric. It's spelled out. It, it's, it's very specific, and uh, which has always been subject to um, each person that's doing the evaluation, their interpretation of it. Now each side knows what specific mm -hmm. tool that they're being measured against. Um, I mean, it's kind of like having a handbook somewhat of a, you know, we spelled out what our dress code is so that they would have more of a leverage to say, okay, this does not follow our dress code. This is the same way with this. This is spelled out more. The teachers have a more of a knowledge of what's expected of them, I think. I think there might have also been a bias in the previous system toward um, <clears throat> not identifying areas for improvement because if someone was graded in something less than whatever it was, the, the scale is, less than average basically, um, 
it required more documentation of the administrator. So it, 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 it would take more effort to identify a needs improvement than it would to just grade a proficient. So I think there might have been a little bit of a bias toward overlooking areas where improvement could, other, could, could occur. You know, okay, so any, any deviation from standard must be accompanied with specific indicators. That's Is there anything that's included on this that's not in the state evaluation tool, the generic one that they will allow? Um, so I don't know what's, uh, you mean what's included in this that's not on the state tool? Mm -hmm. um, I think there was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was there a plan of improvement, plan of intensive assistance like that in the KEEP system? <clears throat> yeah, I thought there was. But okay. I thought there was. Yeah. yeah. I know there wasn't the McCrell system. The McCrell has and really the KEEP is the state system that they're developing. We, the committee quickly came to the conclusion that we didn't want any part of that. Uh, it's very rough draft right now and uh, well if I understand this right if we would accept this as our evaluation then it would be sent to the state and they would have to accept it too correct. so if there is something in there that they feel is not listed or mm -hmm. then they would have the opportunity to tell us that we need to add that or, correct there's some similarity between the Keep and the Danielson system that we're talking about here, right? They're based on the same, um, the same research. research. Yeah. And the Corel system had less emphasis, or had more emphasis, or less emphasis on classroom management. If I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Yeah. But. And the McCrell system uh, seemed to be a good system. Uh, mm -hmm. Committee as a whole thought. This was more, what, what's really going on in the classroom? But if I'm a teacher and I want to, I want to know from the evaluator what can I do to improve. Uh, that's what we're talking about. What, are, what are those things in that rubric, uh, in, in that form? Whereas the other McCrell system was a lot of uh, recognizing diversity and leadership in building and professional learning communities and a lot of stuff that that might be good, but less nuts and bolts of actual teaching in the classroom. Of the teachers that were on this committee, what kind of feedback did you get from them as they look at this rubric? Um, there's going to be some getting used to the idea of uh, the teacher having a more of a part in the evaluation, turning things in and uh, submitting artifacts and lesson plans. Um, but uh, so that'll, that'll be a small hurdle to get over, uh, I think. It's also a PDC question, too. Yeah, the because individual plan. development plan for those that are not being evaluated. We do that anyway with our professional uh, development program, but it's only done once every five years. So the question from the teacher was, do we have to do that again if we've done it already? And it would be, yes, we'll, we'll just fill in the blanks and maybe update that rather than just doing it uh, every five years. You'll look at yours and update it and see what fits for the current year. And it, it will be more time for for the principals, uh, for, the, for those evaluating, uh, sitting down, having the conversations uh, before I think we'll, we'll be good, but it will take more time. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Other questions about the, the teacher evaluation system? Uh, the <coughs> other one on here, I'll, I'll be brief with this one. Uh, we didn't submit this to the committee. Um, building leaders, principals have to also have an evaluation system that meets certain requirements. 
this is our current form here. And I added, uh, I added the wording under that personal qualities and performance, the situational awareness and change agent, just to help me. Uh, this is McCrell's research. Uh, so that helped me work with the principals on their evaluation this year. Um, but again, you see it, uh, the form actually as it was presented to me was, was just <coughs> insert comments about personal qualities and performance and comments about administrator, administrator staff relationship, nothing concrete. So all that other wording is something that I've added this year, which leads us to the new one, which is the research that I've looked at uh, to base the current evaluation system on. The rubric is a little bit different, and the teacher rubric was very similar to this uh, from McCrell. But it goes through, it's a little bit different. Uh, the teacher or the principal would be developing, proficient, accomplished, or distinguished. So each thing, it wouldn't be the principal fits into one category or the other. It's he does this, and he does this, but maybe he doesn't do these things, so we stop there. So it's just set up a little bit differently, and the content is more focused on leading a building being a change agent, being flexible, knowledge of curriculum, assessment, and those things. So, again, pretty involved and uh, requiring a little more effort. And then the summary form that would go in there, personnel file. So, again, we didn't evaluate this as a, as a committee with the teachers and all. <coughs> something we're comfortable with. <clears throat> Any questions on the principal evaluation tool? Okay, again, I'll submit this to the State Department of Education. Uh, some of this is still subject to negotiation, so. You need a motion? Yes. I move the board approve the new teacher and principal evaluation tools as presented for the 14 school year. And move second to approve the new teacher and principal evaluation tools as presented for the 2013-14 school year. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign. Carried 7 up. Next business item, accreditation update. Okay, accreditation is, is how we are as a school, as schools and districts how the state says we're good enough to um, give a diploma and have kids and receive funding uh, and all of that. <clears throat> this is kind of the model where we're headed in accreditation. We're in limbo now with the waiver. We're getting away from the AYP, the adequate yearly progress of minimum proficient on state assessments, uh, which I think we could all agree that that's really not what we're after. Uh, if you think about if we had 100% of our kids in the district <clears throat> passing the math and reading test, would we say we're successful? Would we define that as success? And there's a lot of questions that have to be answered within that, but the answer is probably no. That doesn't prepare our kids to be successful. Hopefully they are, if they're achieving that, that well. But uh, the point is we're getting away from that that idea. So QPA is what we've been working on for years, uh, quality performance accreditation. The quality is, uh, is all of these things listed. Do we have curriculum in place uh, that fits state, uh, state requirements uh, <coughs> and that fits state statutes? Uh, and then the performance has been uh, graduation rate, state assessment, with minimum proficiency and most of the kids, uh, nearly all of the kids taking the tests. So this is kind of where they're headed with the five R's. So we'll see a lot more of this uh, down the road, which uh, gives us some pretty good focus. Rigor, relevance, relationship, responsive culture, and results. So the results would really only be one piece of that. Uh, 
but the other piece of that is preparing kids for a career in college, uh, being responsive with nutrition and wellness and early childhood and some of those things we talk about anyway, but giving us a good focus to how we improve as a district. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how this is all going to work out, uh, but the point is the state's going to be looking at a lot more than how did you do on the state assessment test. And part of that too is this is a, a document that we will see that we'll have to get used to seeing. I'll show you our, uh, our data. There still is a heavy emphasis on state assessment scores. I mean, we still need some accountability. I don't think anybody uh, debates the fact that we need some accountability for how our kids are performing. And some of this we've seen, I'm sure you all remember. Um, the accountability would be four different ways to look at state assessment scores. We'll get used to this, annual measurable objective, so AMO. So each year we have objectives that we need to meet. Uh, we still have the subgroups with uh, you know, Hispanic population and special needs kids. Uh, we'll have four different AMOs, and if we meet one of those, we're said to have made our progress. Okay, uh, If we miss all four, then we don't meet the standard that we're supposed to. So the first AMO is improving achievement and looking at the assessment performance index. Uh, similar to what we've done to say uh, we're achieving the standard of excellence. Uh, so we're still looking at assessment scores, but rather than you may recall this conversation we had. We put kids in each category, and with adequate yearly progress, what we've done is we only get rewarded for getting kids from approaching standards to meet standards. If we move kids from this category to this category, it means nothing. In this category to this category, it means nothing. But as a school, that's what we want to see. We want to see improvement in everybody, not just from this level to this level. So. Points are assigned to each category, and instead of just saying how many kids do we have proficient, we're looking at a, an overall score, adding all these up, is 655. So we can see how that might change from year to year. Here's a good example of uh, not much growth. This is the percent of kids proficient. From one year to the next, 90.9, 92.7, 93.5. So we're not changing a lot. We're just going above or below that uh, red line. This would be when we, when we assign point values, how we can really see that growth. That's the same data. It doesn't look like much growth when you just look at how many kids are passing versus not passing, but we can see how kids are improving. So it gives us a better, more of a focus on growth, not just uh, passing or failing. This is our data. This is what they have presented to us for our goals for this year. Now, we're, we're still in limbo, and I'm going to get tired of saying that, uh, but with our, our State Department of Education, that's where we're at. A lot of things are moving. So this data is based on last year's assessment. This year we're still working on the old assessment. Next year, we don't know. So. We have old data, and we'll be working on a new assessment with the old data and targets, so it's going to get kind of crazy. But this is the percentage of kids we did not have proficient, and then this is that score when they figure all of those things. So you can see pretty flat here, and a little bit of a drop in the growth. So the target is uh, we need to improve uh, 10 points. So see some improvement everywhere. So that's our, our target for growth. And it doesn't matter if it's from not proficient to proficient or whether it's in the top two categories. And then here's math. Uh, so we're expected to see an improvement of, of 13. The second AMO is increasing our growth. So this one's pretty easy. They just average how much did each school or district grow. Uh, and if you're in the top half of that, 
you meet this one. So that's all they're going to do is how much did each school improve from last year to this year? If you're in that top half of that group, then you make that objective. So again, focused on growth and decreasing the gap. If we think of achievement gap, a lot of times we think of uh, minority students to white students or special ed students to uh, students without an IEP. But this is our lowest performing 30% compared to the state average. So when we look at our kids that perform the worst, the lowest percent, the lowest 30% of those, we need to move those kids up and reduce that achievement gap. Here's a good example. This would be the state average. This would be an example of, let's say, our kids, our lowest 30% in the district. Well, they calculate this gap. In six years, we need to reduce that gap in half. So we need to be halfway there to reducing that. So our lowest performing need to be, get closer to the average. So hopefully this gap is, is narrowing. So there's another goal based on growth. Here's our data. <clears throat> our lowest performing 30% in reading uh, scores at this, this level, this number. So that's that index number, at 387. So this is the state average. In six years, we need to be at that red mark. So that's where we're headed. That's our, or halfway to that red mark, I'm sorry. So they give us a goal of we need to improve our lowest performing kids by 30 points. So a lot, what does the point mean? We don't need to focus on that. They do that for us. The point is we're reducing the gap from our lowest performing kids to the state average. Then the fourth is reducing the number of kids we have not proficient. This is what the federal government said, wait a second, we need to make sure we're still getting kids above that red line, so we need to reduce the number of kids we have not passing. Okay? So all of this data, it just shows how many kids do we need to move all of our kids from not being proficient to proficient. And it's 2.08. So a lot of numbers, uh, a lot of stuff for accountability. So it's still there. We still have participation rates. We still have to have most of our kids testing. And graduation rates will still be there. Uh, and at four and five year rates, they calculate that. I'm not going to go through all this. But those are still there. The point is, it's a lot better system focused on growth for all kids, not just, not just moving them above that red line. Okay. Any questions about that, or kind of where we're headed with our accountability? Comments? I, 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 I have questions, but I... I, I think I, it's going to be easier for, and this is, I, I somewhat have issues with this, but <coughs> the state now has 90% of the data because of the kid system. In other words, every kid now, it's like your social security number, every test that you've taken, state assessments, because you do them online, the state now has control of all that now. And so, all this data is just cut and dry, you know, as far as the data that you put in for the the district puts in, the only data I know of is stuff like school. Reduce lunches, and, you know, the status that the kids where they fall in those lines. All the other data is driven from the state level. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. most of it. Uh, yeah. It's easy to track all of this. There's, there's not the gaps from one district to another. The only thing is, is they keep changing the, the testing. And a, a kid takes a test in our district this year. And in another district, they may not be taking that test, so there's, there's gaps there. You know, we may decide to go ahead and test everybody every, and everything. In some districts, because of funding issues, don't. So there is some holes. There. And it's harder for our district because of the lower, the smaller number of kids you have, it's, it's harder to get that line to go up quick, quickly. 
versus a larger district. I think that you're on the right track. It's just one of those numbers. I can see how some of you would think they're all great. But. Well, it seems to me that three of the four still are focused on the lower quadrant or whatever. It's got one that's more big picture, but aren't three of them still focused on um, the bottom? No. The, the gap reduction is focused on the bottom. The achievement is focused on every level moving. Yeah. You know, moving a category, uh, I guess you call it, and then the growth, the gain in growth would be uh, district-wide as or school-wide. How did your scores improve compared to other schools in the state? So if, I guess if you rank all the schools in the state and how much they grew their test scores. If you're in the top half of that, you meet that gain and growth uh, <coughs> category. You've got to meet one. You've got to meet one. 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 Okay. okay, so that gets rid of half of them there, and then yeah. the rest of the people fight over the other three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next category is the top half, or how do they, or when you set a goal of, i got to raise this 10 points, mm -hmm. each school district has a different number of points, or? Yes. Did, yep. And how do they, just curious, how do they determine, um, you know, it's magic, math, I imagine, but. You know, I want a goal of one instead of ten. I don't know how they determine What's the growth model? amount. It's a very complicated yeah. math. Yeah, I, I, I figured it was. Yeah, but I don't have a good way to. That's all right. Explain that. That's all right. Yeah. I just sitting here shaking yeah. my head on part of it. Mm -hmm. We can send you links to videos. That's okay. Send you the link to present. Yeah. <laughs> So again, this is another situation where can we back up? It, it takes more effort and more time, uh, like our teacher evaluation system. But in the end, it's it's a better system, and the state is headed in the right direction. Everyone was set up to fail on the other one. You're buying right. time before you get up so far that kind of hard to improve. Take that last half a second off your 100 meter dash to right. become world class versus good. Yeah. And the second part of that I think too is the focus on all of these other areas, the relevance and uh, Okay, I have a question about that. Things. Yes. Is that about the students or the teachers? The relevance? Well, relationships. All of it. You know, relationships so how do they within the school. Data and with the relationship of the family and the community. I don't know. They haven't answered that question. Far, I think. Yeah, they haven't answered those questions yet. How do we gauge? Uh, you know, it's it's easy to to say how a school is doing on test scores, but how do we gauge whether the school is has a responsive culture in regard to nutrition and wellness? they haven't identified how we determine that yet. And some of that may just be we have to submit what we're doing and, uh, and I don't know. Uh, so Yeah, they're getting what, well, too she's close to the family. You have, you have, you have what doing. statistics on obesity and everything. From, mm -hmm. You know, and there's, there's good that. data that comes out of that, but there's also, but it crosses the line where they're going to do a little more than what they... How I would read that is not necessarily the family, though, of the teacher, but like the artifacts of how a teacher communicates with parents. Right. I don't think that's right. Wanting, we'll see. See how it goes. Sure. 
I think it's crossing the line, though. I don't know how you can ever close the gap unless everyone is scoring the exact same thing potentially. That's kind of like that last half a second off of your. You're never going to close the gap no, unless no. everyone's what, what, got what, the same score. Well, once you get to a certain <clears throat> level, that last bit, you can work all you want, and it's not going to move. And I think some of this is trying to take the emphasis off of a singular test score. How are we doing with kids and their uh, technology? This is this is a work in progress. It is. Yeah. It's, yes. It's, it's yeah. A, probably yeah. another five years. Uh, so two years. Input it'll, be, it'll be implemented in. Uh, input is helpful. A year from August. So if you've got comments, call us. Yeah, I think we need to uh, <laughs> be on top of this and study this stuff. Yeah. As a board. All right, ready to move on? Uh, maintenance and capital improvement. Uh, the goal was uh, to have a capital improvement plan in place by the end of this school year. Um, it could still happen. Um, here's what's, it, it's taken this superintendent a while to understand the needs and uh, come across various other needs. Uh, for example, uh, the roof. Uh, we had a review on the roof about five years ago, four or five years ago, and a scheduled replacement of part of our roof is uh, scheduled for next summer, summer of 2014 price tag estimated about $250,000. So that kind of throws a loop into what we might have planned for the next couple of years uh, and how we go about uh, get filling, fulfilling all of our needs, uh, smaller needs, when those big things come into play. Uh, you know, another thing was the, the heating and air conditioning system here in the library. And that, that could be a very expensive item that needs some attention quickly. Uh, having those things on paper, uh, what we need to do seven years down the road to plan for those things we want to do here in two years or this summer uh, really needs to happen. So let's, I wanted to look at some of this information with you and see if there's some direction as to how uh, or suggestions that the board might have on how we go about getting that plan in place. So this is from that budget document that was provided to you earlier this year explaining the capital outlay fund and where we get that money from. Currently we levy four mills. The board is authorized to go up to eight mills starting next year. That four mills generates about $170,000 in revenue each year. The balance we started with was about 240000 Our budget for this year uh, will keep that about the same. We'll keep that, uh, that cash balance about the same. So that was our goal for this year, is to not reduce that cash balance very much. So this is a list. Uh, met with the district leadership team uh, <clears throat> earlier this year. We got a lot of ideas uh, on things to improve the facilities, uh, equipment and furniture, uh, some technology needs, ongoing maintenance, and then our vehicles is one of those areas that just, it is what it is, that's what we have. The, the ones that are highlighted there are probably the ones that are more in need of some attention in the near future. Other information here, this is what we've completed so far out of our uh, capital outlay budget for this year. And then the remaining budget, a little more than $60,000, uh, which the budget would start over July 1. So we've got that amount of money. Uh, is there plans for that yet? What's that? Is there plans to spend uh, the that next page, year? page 28. Sorry. Here's a that's all right. Here's a list of some summer projects uh, that we're looking at. Most of these with rough 
estimates. There's a wide range for the library HVAC and boiler. What, <coughs> what would be the range? Anywhere from the replacing the chillers, um, the labor and materials to get that done, just replacing those to uh, completely redoing the system, to connect it, uh, to redo the control system, to connect it in with our existing control system in the main building. Uh, that's a, a difficult thing with, we have to have the gentleman come out with his computer and reset the, the computer in order to change things. We have a little bit of control on the wall, a range of a few degrees, and we can turn things off. Uh, but to really control the system, we don't have that capability. And so updating the control system really adds to that cost. I don't think we would be at the high end of that. Uh, but the engineer's estimates were 60000 on the on the low end. And that didn't include the boiler. That was we were just talking about the uh, getting the chillers replaced, and updating whatever equipment needs uh, needs fixed. So that's why there's such a wide range there. Can some of those monies come from the library money that they have? <coughs> they could. The danger there is taking a big chunk of that money, uh, and that then that money wouldn't be available for. Uh, yearly expenditures. So that's the danger there. Uh, but yes, it could. Well, I think some of these that directly affect, affect the teaching, the tech lab and remodeling computers is probably a, one thing I'd like to see go forward. As we I think we are behind in our technology. We have our playground uh, to put grass and irrigation system there. Um, Can that be covered by a grant or something? Uh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know of a grant to do that, but yes. And, I know. The, yeah. and the PTO is more than willing to Try to get something done and raise some money. Well, that's donate some labor. Yeah, and children playing is you can put that as a health healthy side. Anytime you can get children's health issues in a grant, you can score a little higher. And one thing we had discussed earlier this year is the restroom updates and getting getting some things. Uh, this wouldn't be complete remodel or anything, but uh, getting the hot water done uh, and in place. So, until an engineer comes in or a professional comes in to tell us what we need to do to make that happen, you know, that may, may change, but if the hot water is nearby, it's just a matter of getting it plumbed, plumbed in. Is this stuff that you, that you want to do? I mean, yes. Do you want yeah. us to X something off? <clears throat> if, if there's things that I'm missing, if there's things that don't belong there, uh, some direction there. I mainly included the things on the bottom, just as uh, how, these things need to happen, but how do we pay for that without a plan? <laughs> The intercom system would be nice, but that might be one of the things that could go to the bottom of the list. Uh, yeah, I should have addressed that. that. Um, right now, we don't have a bell system. Yeah, okay. When we had that power situation of brownout uh, a month ago or so, uh, fried our intercom system. Okay. And it's an old so system. And it was one of those things where, uh, what's the man's name? You remember? Don. Don is the only person in the world who knows about the system. No. The way we've had people come in uh, to see about <coughs> fixing it so we can put three or four thousand in it and it still might not fix it. So we're, we have an all call system. Uh, 
but we don't have a bell system now. She just mentioned insurance. If that's, yeah. is that not worth trying to make a claim it, yeah, for? Yeah, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I hadn't tried. And it's it's an old system. And it's it's in need of an update. So. What are you using now? We have an all call system. We have no bells. And it's it, we're two months out from getting it. The day I say come put it in, it's going to be two months to get the equipment in and get it scheduled. So, so at that point we kind of knew doing it right now or doing it a month later. We're looking at next fall before we get it uh, usable for a bell system. And carpeting in the areas with that? We have a lot of needs. There's uh, classrooms, the uh, Choir room uh, needs has uh, asbestos tiles in it need to be removed. The carpeting's in bad shape in there. Some of that tile's in pretty rough shape. So uh, that and then high school side, a lot of those classrooms uh, we probably won't get all that we need to this summer. So you could have <clears throat> 140 there, and you have 60 left, so you have about 80,000 that you go into next year's off of next yeah. year's capital outlay, which means you still have roughly about 100,000 to spend out next year's for the future projects. And if if the board does, you know, some of that will, some of this will depend on what the budget looks like next year and where a mill levy is. But uh, if you remember a bond payment will come off of our mill levy. So even if the board bumps the mill levy up to eight, it we will still be reducing our mill levy overall. Uh, but if that mill levy is bumped up to eight, we won't see any of that revenue until uh, for half of the year. Because the beginning of next school year, we're still working on uh, this calendar year for the taxes. So. Once you up the mill levy for that, you really don't see it for half a year. But there is potential there for raising that, uh, that mill levy and added revenue to help fund some of these. I was wondering things. if like, the library um, <coughs> heating and air conditioning um, can be put on like a, we just put it out there like 2014 we replace that and that'd be a community project that we work through uh, to help put that bill. So getting all the school district. And can the city come through with some some of their capital outlay to help us with that? Speaking of the city, was that proposed number on increase that they were going to fund the library next year or something that you sent out? Or is that a... That's, yeah, that's next item on the list. Oh. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I might have some ideas on things that could play into a library you, know, you talk about grants but having some planning going into writing those proposals would be helpful you know um, so if, if your point of kind of coming up with a, a longer term plan having you know, having those kinds of plans in place makes the basis of a stronger grant application. You know, just mm -hmm. on a whim applying for a grant because it's there. It shows sometimes. I wonder if there's an efficiency. <coughs> Being that old, there's got to be a, some sort of efficiency grant or some money that you can take off because you're if more you efficient. Remember that energy review I had done earlier this year. They will do that and guarantee your energy savings um, to replace lights and old boilers and some of those things. And, uh, 
theoretically it works out where the energy savings pays for any improvements, the payment for those improvements. Uh, the only drawback to those is they're, they're high in uh, administrative costs because they come in and spec everything out and, and do the bidding. So uh, if you go into it understanding that that's going to be a cost to have them do it, we can sure pursue it. If you remember some of our discussions in the past, you know, I'm busy with some architects and uh, just to generate some ideas and see how they might be able to work with us. And, uh, any discussions about office area or weight room or any of those things really come to how do we do any of that with all of this, especially without a plan. So <clears throat> if the board doesn't uh, have direction on how we we accomplish that plan. I'll just take it on and we'll I'll include who we need to include. But. What year were you thinking on the roof replacement? It's scheduled uh, in the, for 2014, summer of 2014. Now this company comes out and does a roof review. Uh, they gave me a quote when I had them come back out to bring me the plan that I knew we had, I just didn't have it. I didn't know where it was. So they brought another copy and gave me a quote on doing the review again. It's it's six or seven thousand dollars for them to do that that review and, uh, and engineers estimates and all those things. Now that's a tough thing to swallow when you just say come out and do that for us. But if it's something that you put away a thousand dollars a year and every six years you have that done. Ultimately, hopefully it saves you money on them giving direction on this preventative maintenance, this is going to need to replace, and those things. So sometimes I have a stomach that when the people giving the review are the same people doing the work. work. Yeah. And, that, and that's the, uh, these people don't do the work. Okay. Yeah. They got an interest. It really helps your pocket. Yeah. You guys had a hailstorm. Can you get any insurance? <laughs> Usually doesn't hurt. I'd, I'd really like to see you put something together, a three-year plan of capital improvements. Well, we um, just, just kind of get a what's going to happen in the next three years. And kind of, and we're just going to really give direction of what's being spent out of capital outlay without spending it down all the way. Mm -hmm. I agree to me the, the roof is the number one thing and everything else pieces around it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's hard to get by a year you know, when you have a leaky roof. Mm -hmm. it's like <clears throat> it's leaked forever. What about the um, items that he has for this improvement? I think the aircon needs, he needs to proceed with that ASAP. Can you prioritize that? Yeah. Have that for next. Or maybe we should give him direction on the authority to move on three items off of there and then give the rest of them priority to us. You get that remaining budget in there, so. The uh, exterior doors in the high school gym will be that locker room door and then the double doors at that end of the gym. Um, they're in bad shape. The one, the locker room door is one we've had security issues with. It needs a uh, a different locking system uh, to get a quote to replace those doors. Everyone had different ideas on all that. I was just thinking from our tour, hot water is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. But who knows what that costs? <coughs> What's wrong? Mm -hmm. 
Well, right. the preschool room is going to be a necessity if we, you know, you know, we go down the list. We list everything. I feel <laughs> confident we can get get all this done if the costs stay within that that range. Uh, again, we start over the budget year. year one. So I say work on. Going to check on insurance on the yeah. intercom. Are we comfortable? Well, when we had the report from the um, survey, because I know there were some parents that brought up some issues about our school and things that some of this would encompass. And yeah, the oh, CISL. From, uh, mm -hmm. from the, the parent mm -hmm. surveys or. Um, they said first week of April I would have a rough draft. They're coming in May to formally present. So I might give you an idea of what, you know? Yeah. Because I know there was a lot of things that was brought up. Nothing further on capital improvement. I give you a direction that yep. you need. Mm -hmm. uh, library funding. Uh, we've we've discussed this is, issue quite a bit. I've discussed it with the library board um, frequently. Um, there's some uh, animosity uh, there. Uh, I don't know some bad blood from from years. I don't know all of the history. I've tried to understand it. Uh, worked with them. I think it's just if we be honest and 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 upfront about what's happening here. Um, I think that's the best. I visited with city council about it. Um, there is interest to do uh, to help somehow, uh, but now's the time. We're going to be putting together our budget this summer. Uh, the city will be as well. So having some hard numbers to what do we want? What do we need to happen? Um, a lot of this is the old information. <clears throat> you know, it's about half and half for general public, patrons, and school staff use. Hours of operation is about 50-50. Now, here's the, the balance of costs. You see where the district covers about three-fourths of that. Another thing we've run into is how do we determine those costs? What does the library cost? Because we have things uh, from different funds and we have to portion things out. Uh, and, and nobody's trying to ignore the fact that the school uses this building on a regular basis. I think the one thing that if we can get past that this library isn't a city library, it's not a school library, and we can't divide it up that way. This is the library. The school district operates it, and that's the way it is. Uh, if we can see this as one library, and all of the programs involved benefit kids and benefit the community, uh, I think we'll be better off. And at some point, I know we have to decide how much is it costing each party, but when you do that, uh, we get into, well, what is the city's and what is what is the schools? Uh, and everything we do benefits the library operation. So what, what is being proposed? <clears throat> um, and again, this is just a draft uh, to make sure the board is comfortable with me proceeding with a formal request from these parties. The educational foundation, most of that is reserved for the library. And that balance has increased. What are we doing with those funds? It was set aside to operate the library. Traditionally, that has been used for materials, to buy books, to buy supplies and those things. I think we need to get away from that uh, and not just identify it as purchasing materials, but helping fund library operations, paying the utility bill, paying salaries, and some of those things. And that's what I'm, I'm thinking about with, we have to get past that division, that if we operate the library, the librarian works for the school district, but uh, helps the city uh, patrons, helps the, the students as well. Uh, so we will need to get over that idea. Um, 
the city's contribution, if we could increase that a little bit uh, to 25,000, you can see the current funding situation compared to the proposed funding situation. That increase of $7,000 for the city isn't a magic number. Uh, I think 60% is probably a good number for the district's share of expenses to be at. So it's not a magic number, it, it, it could change, but those things will make a pretty big difference to our budget from year to year. The library uh, funds in the foundation, um, you can see what the balance has done there, I've tried to explain here. Um, I've done research about endowment funds and talk to the people at the South Central Community Foundation where our investments are um, and what, what is a common percentage? Well, nobody wants to tell me what that is. Uh, there's always a disclaimer. I, I mean, I get it. The market goes up and down and I'm not going to hold you to your percentage that you tell me, but a, a good round number, a national average is five and a half percent. So. The 40,000 represents 4.7% of that, the library's share of that balance. So it would allow quite a cushion to, uh, if the investment did drop, there's still money there. We're not going to eat into that, that balance. Uh, initially, we had talked about we just need to set a percentage of, of the fund balance to take out each year. Uh, the danger with that is the big fluctuations, how do we take care of that? If we're still stuck on, we need a percentage, we should use a, a, uh, an average. Uh, so you can see those graphs show. Um, see, I'm a math teacher, I take the long way around to get to, why don't we just have $40,000 or assigning a certain dollar amount. But if the if the prevailing thought is that we should have a, a percentage of the fund, it should be based on a, on a yearly average, say the last three years. So you can see the actual fund balance, what it's done, the wide ranges. If you average it, it kind of levels that out a little bit. So, but the easiest way to level that out is just say it's $40,000. So sometimes I have to not think like a math teacher. I think we need to start spending some of it, utilize it this way. Now, one thing, Tom's question earlier about could we take some of the foundation uh, library money to uh, replace the air conditioner, and doing that would change what we're doing here. And uh, I guess it's six one way, half a dozen another. This would help with operational expenses year in and year out. Um, and then the one-time expense, we would have to take that on as the district. It becomes part of our capital improvements. So I guess that's the... But this is unrestricted money. I mean, whereas <coughs> you can only use capital outlays for capital outlays. So wouldn't it be more strategic to be able to use capital outlay money for the air conditioning improvements and then not not our operational funds, which are only, you know, I mean, they're, they're yeah. the ones that have more pressure on them for more demands anyway. Right. And these these dollars, the forty thousand, and uh, you know, is money that would be added to our budget, basically. It would cover costs we're paying for anyway, and free up some room to do other things. Actually, it's twenty-two thousand. Right, right. <clears throat> you don't need a motion on this. At no, all. Uh, no, just just, uh, just consensus if we're all okay with uh, making that request. Mm -hmm. So has that uh, fund uh, made five and a half percent, even though taking out that twenty-five thousand every year? Does it make that much money? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and actually, we 
there wasn't money removed every year. I think it was three disbursements out of the last eight years. And one of those calendar years was two disbursements. So, so yes and no. There's been some disbursements from that, but not every year. 2000. Reduction to that. It was a market reduction, not a spending reduction. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. No further discussion. We'll move on to the other <coughs> item. And that will be concealed carry. Uh, there's. <coughs> Bills, uh, two different bills, House Bill 2055, it's labeled, the other one, the Senate Bill, is labeled uh, 186, but it's a different House Bill, maybe 2052, that's not important. Um, what this bill does, um, House Bill 2055 has passed the House, <coughs> includes public buildings, if, if the public building cannot ensure that weapons don't come into the building, then concealed carry uh, permit holders uh, must be allowed to carry their firearm into your building. So for a school, uh, we would have three choices. We can allow concealed carry permit holders to bring firearms onto our premises, which we don't now. We can right now, if, if the board would choose to do that. Uh, nothing in law prevents us from doing that uh, right now. Or uh, we implement extensive security measures, which the law doesn't say what that has to be. Um, or uh, we can apply for an exemption uh, by submitting a plan, a safety plan of how we address those things. And it would be an exemption for four years, I think. <coughs> from this law. So we would not have to allow concealed carry permit holders to, to carry on campus. It also allows uh, <coughs> uh, uh, licensed employees to carry uh, if, if the, the board would allow it. Uh, there have been some school districts that have, have chosen to do that and allow a employee or multiple employees to carry uh, in the school building. Uh, I don't know where this law will go uh, and exactly what it will mean for us, but I thought it would be prudent for this board to have a discussion about feelings about having a teacher or a uh, another employee carry uh, a weapon on campus. Uh, or at a ball game. A patron carrying a concealed weapon. I just hate the fact that we have to even talk about it. One for the teacher wants to carry. I mean, they got a concealed carry. They don't. I don't know, like I said, I hate to see any weapons on campus, but there ain't no reason to give somebody the opportunity to just come in and start shooting people without. The issue that I have with that is, let's say a teacher brings that in, where do they put that down? Who becomes liable if it's in a cabinet gets broken into? I, there's, it's dang if you do and dang if you don't on this particular situation. And I, I'd rather err on the side of safety, like they have now. That guns are not allowed on school premises. Period. I'm not sure law. I think it's the safest route to go. 
because we have locked doors. Well, if you have it in the cabinet, it's not going to do you much good. Exactly. you got to run to it. And if, if you're carrying a gun as a teacher, do you think that's, do you think every kid's going to learn the same? I think that some, some people are going to have some issues. And if you have a gun that's in a teacher's purse, and the teacher leaves that person laying out, they, I mean, they've got to have it locked up, it doesn't do any good. So they'll probably leave it lay out, and then what happens? The kid knows that, hey, they've got a permit to carry it. I know they have a handgun in there. It's easy to pick up. So I just think he has more issues by allowing it to happen versus <coughs> keeping the law as it currently reads and just be mindful of what's going on. I, I like when people carry guns, but I think it also allows for more people to carry that don't need to have them. Well, if you got a conceal and carry permit, though, you went through extensive background. I mean, it's just not anybody gives a conceal and carry. Yeah. Chad, how old do you have to be? It's just an eight hour. Yeah, I, was on I, I agree with you, brother. 21. 21. 21. 21. Yeah, you have to go through an extensive background check mm -hmm. to, to be able to have it, but to, to press the class is a, it's not like an AR class. It's not yeah. The background check, I'm not worried about the background. I'm more worried about the little air when they leave it laid there and that need to be there. You have more guns accessible. It's better left at home. There's a there's a different situation when you bring that gun into a schoolroom setting. I think for just the, the reasons that you were talking mm -hmm. about. I mean, bring your gun to a ball you're game. liable. You're liable. <laughs> now, you're personally liable for everything that can happen. Thanks, Matt. But. Trouble. but <laughs> Yeah. The things that can happen are a lot greater if that gun is in a school than it is if you were at the shopping mall. You're literally, by definition, in an environment where you've got a lot of people who have less than fully developed judgment, you know, and they're, they're kids, and but I don't think that they, that they need play to be things. around guns where a number of accidents can happen aside from just teaching them that this is the way we exist and protect ourselves. I just don't, I don't like the, the culture of it either. Well, I don't yeah. like going to the being fear or whatever we want to call it. I'm all in favor of the police making their presence known in school whenever they want to and at ball games and that. But as far as concealed carry, uh, I'm not in favor of it at school. Well, I think being in a small community, our police are pretty available if needed, I hope. Which I don't live in this town either, but, uh, you know, if need be, hopefully that they would be here. I, don't I think there's so many know. different angles that you have to think about right here because there's curiosity on the uh, kid, Kids have a cur very curious mind, and we don't know what all of those are, especially on those that have a um, negative view on life. I mean, they can, they, their judgment, as you mentioned, can be way off the wall. And I just feel like that it's just better if we just leave that environment someplace else and not give a chance for that environment. Uh, I hope that we have a really safe school. I, I really do. If it's that unsafe, then I believe that we may have some kids that choose not to go to school. But I, I really believe we have a safe environment. And I hope the lawmakers, believe, I think we all need to contact our legislative people and have them think about this. What do they think? I think if you, if, 
anybody who is armed in a school needs to be trained like a police officer. If they're not actively, you know, taking active shooter trainings and um, involved in that, I think I wouldn't feel comfortable having having somebody carry and the eight hour class doesn't train me for that. Get through the loop, jump through the, the, the loophole of getting the permit doesn't mean you're trained to address the situation. You know, just a situation with you know, two kids in a fist fight and one's beating the tar out of another one. You think you're protecting a life, but does that justify uh, shooting a kid? You know, just as an example. How do we deal with those situations and be trained to deal with those? I think there would have to be a lot of training before before I would even feel comfortable carrying a gun. And I feel pretty comfortable carrying one. I wouldn't uh, some of us adults get carried away at ball games. <laughs> Yeah, the refs might turn around and see. <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's a scary proposition, <laughs> idea, depending on who. Well, the sad part about it, these students play these video games and they shoot somebody and then they come back to life in the next video game. They don't realize that, you know, death is death and they're not going to come back. And like you said, you got all the inquisitive minds and everything else. And I just we're setting ourselves up. But. I, I feel very comfortable around firearms, and I feel very comfortable when there's a police officer in the building. I've never felt uneasy about that. Even if we had a police officer that was there every day, I wouldn't feel uneasy about it. Because I know he's trained. I know he knows how, how to handle how situations. Is Adam or whoever? To the store. Oh, Just curious. At least once a week. Yeah. Maybe here. Two or three times a month. Probably. Three or yeah. three times a month. Two or three times a month. And we've had Officer Fisher here once a week. Right. So for a Dare. while. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any input from the side table? Insurance is another situation that would have to be worked out for. I, I don't know what that would be if, if any school personnel were allowed to carry what that would do. So we don't have to do insurance at this time? No. no. Uh, other than if you don't feel this is correct, contact your... We may have to Representatives and stuff? We may have to make a decision on what route do we take there. So yeah. I guess that was the main point in getting it out in, out in the air that we may have to deal with this next month or and then, July 1. There won't be a distinction made between uh, school hours or extracurricular activities. I mean, the only distinction be... right now that's made is school buildings. Okay. Or school property? No. School building. School building. So if we decide to opt out of the, do we have to hang signs around saying we're a zone, a gun free we zone? We have the, the gun buster signs now that say concealed carry is not allowed. Yeah. Um, Those are on the buildings now. So how the police officers go about us? They're exempt. They're exempt. Or, yeah. So, <laughs> well, can anybody come in then? No, I, I think it's a state law, but no, I think Kansas is an open carry state, except yeah. for government school buildings, I don't think you can open carry in places like that. You can only carry concealed with a permit? Right, you can only carry concealed with a permit. In, in schools? No, so you, can't can't it all. you can't do it anywhere that's supposed to. Well, you can carry the gun outside. You're fine. I'm sorry. But you have to leave it outside right. if you go you in. Can't. You, know, right. just you can't. Oh, you can't carry it in the school. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. 
kid can't have it. Can they have a gun in their vehicle parked? No. No. Not always no. Right. That's what we okay. school. Right. And I thought we said right. buildings. Yeah. I'm talking concealed carry okay. uh, laws pertain to school buildings. <coughs> okay. That's for license right. permit holders. Okay. Right. The distinctions made between buildings and not buildings. Well, that's the only thing I hear is that little sign out there that says, this is a gun free zone. <coughs> so anybody can come in here. I mean, anyone could go anywhere and do it. Well, I'm just saying if you got a couple of guns in the school, it's going to make a difference. Possibly can. I mean, it was principals or you yeah. know, you just had it for the Just the sign the saying that. Yeah, just a sign saying that. Well, you yeah. know. But I'm thinking my concealed carry class next weekend. I can put an ad in the paper and then take it as class. might have his gun. <laughs> All right, we'll move on. Communications. <laughs> Thanks for that communication, Mayor. Uh, board member reports. Stan? I'm going to pass. Right, just our evaluation meeting, which you heard about. All right. Thanks for attending. I don't think I have anything. Mm -hmm. Start negotiations with the special ed co-op this week. It may last several weeks. Uh, going smooth. Had a good, good uh, conversation. It just will not be pretty because of the funding <coughs> issue. And uh, I think the big talk that the, uh, Mr. Meyer may have alluded to this, but special ed funding is probably going to affect us. We'll probably have to spend more money there. It, there's less than get federal government funding and so forth. So look for that to, to affect us a little bit. But other than that, that's it. Uh, <coughs> then we'll have administrative reports. Andrea? Yeah, my report is in your <coughs> packet and up on the screen there. Both my third and fourth grade are participating in um, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Pilots. Um, Mr. Bergen had seventh graders go through that this fall. Third graders will be doing a math, and fourth graders will be doing the ELA, which is English Language Arts, and we're going to start that this week, and we'll finish up next week. Um, I want to know uh, teachers and other people around the school are excited to kind of see what those look like, um, how the kids do. So we'll get a lot of information from those assessments. Um, in our after school program, which we call LIFE, you hear people talk about that, the LIFE program. Um, most current information from Mrs. Laura Davis is that we have 44 children enrolled and the average daily attendance is in the high 20s up to, you know, 35. So it's an active program. We have a lot of kids here after school participating in that. Um, and uh, the folks that are working in that program, I think, are doing a great job getting it going. And again, we've got a lot of kids taking advantage of it. So I think that's great. Um, on April 10th, um, the Dairy Association is bringing their mobile dairy classroom here probably be set up in this parking lot. So if you drive by and see a big, you know, semi-trailer and dairy cow out there, that's what's going on. Um, and that was free, is free, um, and so we'll have some kids taking advantage of that. Uh, elementary track meets coming up May 10th, and you may be contacted to see if you'd like to volunteer for that event. Um, it's always a lot of fun for everybody. K6 enrollment, I actually lost a kindergartner today to a move, so I'm down to 157. Um, Mr. Bergen asked me the other day if I was up or down from count day, and my count day was 152, so I am, I'm up a little bit from September 20th. <coughs> um, Pre-K enrollment, um, 
we are up. We're getting uh, several from Maxville. Site Council PTO meeting was this evening at 6, at 6 p.m. Um, and that group provided some treats for classes taking state assessments. I uh, know teachers and kids appreciated that, and I'm pleased to see the group doing some active things for our teachers and kids. Our next meeting will be May 6th before the board meeting. Kindergarten Roundup is scheduled for April 19th. Right now, our list to be screened is 43 which is a little bit bigger than in the past. So we have a lot on the list right now. A little bit. Um, well, and you guys, you know, you know how these things go. You, it goes up, it goes down, it, you know, um, that we'll see how many show up, um, are ready for kindergarten, those kinds of things. But that's how many we're sending out information. Um, the St. John pre-K screening was March 15th. Uh, 32 three through five-year-olds were screened at that event. Um, that was not everyone that was on our list and that we sent information to, but you know there are conflicts and things like that, and hopefully we can catch the rest of our three through five-year-olds um, in the next several screenings. So, any questions for me? What's the two from Maxwell mean? I mean, was that in Maxwell District that they might come here? Um, well, they are children that are in the Maxwell District, and they're counted by the Maxwell District, but the Maxwell District is not able to provide those children the services that they need. So they come here to get the services that they need. Even special ed? Yes. So, okay. they're still my kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael. Um, the enrollment for 712, I think it's, you know, there's a couple, we have a couple more than work out day. Uh, we just had a seventh grader who left, so uh, exactly 25. But it's been right around that number the whole year. Um, I just <coughs> mentioned a little bit about state assessments where we're talking a little bit about the new system that's going to be put in place eventually. Um, we'll start doing these uh, assessments uh, this month, finishing up beginning of May. Um, last Tuesday evening, uh, I want to mention that we uh, took nine students to the uh, Central Prairie League Honors Banquet, which we have every year. It just rotates around to the schools, takes turns hosting it. Next year, actually, St. John hosted next year. So that won't be as near as much fun as going to Victoria. <laughs> um, but um, it, we'll have to suffer through it. Anyway, those were the uh, nine students that attended, and, um, so that was nice to recognize the kids. And you can we take the top ten percent of the junior and senior class. Yes, I know ten uh, six juniors do not equal uh, ten percent of twenty six. I know that. So, but we have six juniors that are four point oh. So uh, you know we just rounded it up and took them all because that's just the way it is. So we've done that before. So. That's why there's six juniors there, three seniors. Um, we have regional solos, small ensembles. I think we have a few kids going to that on Saturday. And I'll try to get some results for you next month. Uh, junior senior play is in a couple weeks. Um, prom. Anybody wants to come prom, you want to you come supervise or watch the dance, want to learn a few moves, you're welcome to come over for that. Um, track and golf are underway, as you all know. The Junior High All Sports Booster Club Banquet is the 18th. Also on the 18th, I didn't mention, but we have large group music at Pratt. The band and vocal will be performing state music um, at Pratt on that morning, on the 18th. Um, I didn't uh, mention uh, state basketball. Uh, as we all know, with boys and girls, uh, the girls received a uh, sportsmanship, will receive plaques and medals for it. Uh, sportsmanship, and we have there's a there's a committee every year at all the state tournaments that sit around the uh, arena, and they have rating sheets and they rate fans, coaches, players, administrators. They rate everybody, and they have a rating sheet and a rubric, and they mark it all out. And they send those to you, and you can look them on the Keisha website. And you can go on the Keisha website and look, and you can see all the uh, schools that were awarded plaques or uh, medals. 
our sportsmanship and our girls will, will be, we haven't gotten them yet, but we will be getting them. So I thought I'd mention that. Um, the, uh, we have um, our next uh, Central Prairie League, League meeting on Wednesday. Um, I just put that on there. Um, Madison Lodge has asked us to consider looking at them to join our league. So I'm just making you aware of it. And it's really early, and they're just asking. So. That'd be a good road trip from yeah. Madison yeah. Lodge to Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Nest City. But yeah. Across. They've got a nice bus, I think, so it'd be all right. Yeah. Okay. Air conditioning, so I guess it'd be yeah. fine. Yeah. So anyway, they're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about that on Wednesday. Yeah. With that. Um, Mr. Bergen? Yes. How many votes does it take? Yeah, to, we have, we, to get a league school in, yeah, we have eight school, it takes six out of the eight. But Elwood's coming in too, right? Pardon? Elwood's coming yeah, in? Yeah, Ellenwood's coming in. And we, uh, you know, some of our schools in our league, we currently, we play them in basketball. Yeah. And, and some of the schools do as well. They're, at, they're officially coming in 14, 15. And that would make nine schools when they get in. Yeah. And so, you know, I guess if you have nine, it'd be, it'd be easier to have an even number if you wanted to have divisions, like kind of like what we do with our junior high, we divide up in the east and west. And, but, you know, Medicine Lodge is a long way from it. So I don't have any idea how that will be received. But, yeah. So, but Joaquini's, you know, mentioned about coming out of the Ellis. Ellis is a long way away, you know. Um, so what? When, when would they vote? Or is this just a discussion? As far as Med Lodge? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it would, if we did this, we'd, it would just be, it would probably be June, my guess, at the earliest, if we got really serious about it. Yeah. Right. And when it gets to that point, you know, I'll haul her back and see where we want to, where you guys stand on that. So, and we've got to see what, with any school, obviously. So, yeah. And then you have, yeah, activity accounts. So, any questions or? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, first, I didn't have this on my report, but um, this is uh, Ken Fisher uh, filled out a grant application with Monsanto. Uh, he got a $2,500 grant, uh, and they doubled it. And the $2,500 went to a 4-H group uh, over in Stafford, and then uh, the rest of it was awarded to us, and that was a picture we went over uh, with the Monsanto grant, and, uh, Mr. Fisher. Um, Mr. Cooper came along. That money's going to go to the Earth Partnership uh, program where they're going to put in a, a garden out by the, uh, uh, the playground and out in front by the marquee sign. Um, so they've been looking at how do we fund that project and get some gardens for classrooms and just to make things look a little better. That's pretty good seed money right there. So very appreciative of that uh, money there. Also, some time ago, uh, Chad mentioned about a Monsanto grant uh, for ten or $25,000. I've been working on that grant application for iPads and uh, equipment for Mr. Delp's room. So those would be in his room, and he would use them to collect data and uh, do some you know live experiments and go out and test soil and test water. And, uh, some of those things. So the focus is on you know getting kids engaged in science and excited about that. So that's due here in a month, and we'll have that turned in, and we'll get a some Facebook campaign going to get some more uh, nominations. Uh, at least uh, for all the, the farmers that use Facebook to go on there and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and nominate our school district. Our preschool update, uh, I wish we had a solution for this uh, uh, preschool situation. Uh, we're still working with Stafford and the, uh, the grant people with Head Start on how we make this happen. Um, it's a big step to make our classroom a Head Start classroom. Um, we don't know what all that involves. The Head Start people aren't really excited about us doing that, don't think we can really get it done. Um, but it makes a big difference in how much it will cost us. And we will not pull the trigger and hire somebody unless I'm positive we can make it work uh, with the money. 
So I'm pretty sure we can, but pretty sure is not good enough. So we have some details to work out with Stafford, and uh, we have some other variables that we'll know about uh, with our insurance premiums for next year uh, coming up here this month uh, for health insurance. Uh, negotiations will begin that work. Um, and uh, enrollment and personnel who we can get to do that. So uh, it's late in the year to still be up in the air about that, but that's where we are. And uh, we'll meet again on April 9th uh, with them. So we should have uh, a firm decision by the second week of April and know where we're headed with that. Um, <clears throat> professional development, April 19th. Uh, we had scheduled the uh, previous month to uh, send teachers out to visit other schools to see what's going on, what ideas can they bring back. Uh, we're going to do that on April 19th uh, now, and we'll come back. We're going to visit about our, uh, our the trip, what, what did we gain, what ideas did we get. Uh, we got some going to Otis Bison to look at iPads, going to Bentley to look at how they structure their schedule for MTSS uh, with their elementary. <clears throat> got some going to Sterling or Smoky Valley. Smoky Valley. Smoky Valley. Smoky Valley. Uh, so the, the idea there is just get out, see what's going on, what ideas can you bring back, and then we'll visit about our evaluation tool also. Uh, district website, I think I mentioned this to you in a note, but we will uh, be revamping our website a little bit. It's not so much that the website needs updated, it's that uh, we have a free tool for website building and we get what we pay for. Uh, and it's, it's free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How much? How much? What's the cost? Uh, but the idea there is having uh, better access and better tools where uh, principals and teachers and uh, librarians can get on and create their own uh, site easily and add their own information. Uh, so right now it's a difficult situation so uh, not everybody will use it uh, but it removes that barrier of uh, of the difficulty of the tool to get people involved in using that special education uh, co-op budget I know Merlin has mentioned it uh, the bottom line with this situation is they're spending too much money they're not in the red they're not uh, um, they're not bankrupt they've got significant cash balance, but it's dwindling. That problem needs to be fixed. That's what we're dealing with. Um, what does that mean for us? There will be reduced personnel, co-op-wide, in every district. Every district is going to have to come up with uh, 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 some portion of those cuts, uh, which 85% of their budget is salaries, personnel costs. You can't cut the budget without losing jobs. That's just the way it is. That's their uh, their business is set up. Uh, their, their business, uh, the way they do things. Uh, so for us, that may mean reducing uh, people in our building. Uh, also, eventually, it may mean uh, increased assessment. Uh, I don't. I don't think we will for next year. Uh, more than. A nominal amount, but you know, we pay money from our district funds to help fund the co-op, and uh, eventually that that may need to be increased. But no, that's not said by the state. No, there's two. Um, there's money comes from the state, flows through us, goes to them, uh, and then on top of that, we pay. Every district pays an amount to help cover the additional costs. That based on the number of kids enrolled yes. in their yes. services. Yeah. Okay. No, enrolled in their school. In their school. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's not based on how much you use special ed, but how big your school district is. Yeah. Uh, uh, election coming up tomorrow. So, uh, Mr. Bear's on the ballot. Uh, so don't forget to vote. Uh, your local uh, election. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the CISL review. Um, that information uh, 
will be coming and uh, again that formal presentation will be uh, in May so Bill Savers will be back to present that uh, that information to us uh, legislative stuff uh, a budget as far as the state funding we ought to know this week uh, they're cleaning up some things there that they've agreed on a budget the legislature has now it's a matter of how do we fund it uh, they're working through the sales tax issue now uh, next year's budget may be okay without that additional revenue from sales tax uh, future years won't be uh, so uh, I wish I felt comfortable with where we were going to be uh, felt more comfortable uh, but those questions still need to be answered this week um, so funding will be flat uh, it's better than a reduction um, but costs will increase insurance will go up um, what we do with negotiations uh, any additional costs have to be offset with a reduction somewhere else so that's the problem with with flat funding um, there's been discussion about um, a mandatory 10% local option budget. Now, why would they do that? The only reason they would do that is to fight against the lawsuit, the, uh, the school funding lawsuit. If they say every district has to have 10% of their local option budget moved into general fund, now that becomes state funding because right now every district has 20 mills levied for their general fund that's considered base state aid so you, we have to levy a tax for a local option budget and move that to the general fund it increases uh, base state aid to 4900 or something like that uh, but it's moving money out of your left pocket putting it in your right pocket uh, there's not been a decision made on that, but that could um, spell some headaches for us. But beyond that, revenue wise, it, it won't make a difference. Um, the union issues, teacher unions, uh, they did pass a bill the governor uh, has signed or uh, is on his desk to sign um, with the paycheck deductions uh, for political activities. They made that uh, illegal. They can't. We can't deduct money out of the paycheck to go to political activities. We can still renew, uh, deduct money for union dues, but any of that money that goes to uh, the union's political activities can't be done in the payroll deduction. Teachers can still donate uh, to that cause. Uh, just they have to write the check for it. Um, the issues of the negotiations and the items that should be negotiable and which should be permissible to be negotiated, uh, that work has stopped. They said, we're not going to decide that this year. Talk about it and we'll revisit next year. So no change with the Professional Negotiations Act. Uh, back on the budget, you've heard the sequester, the federal sequester, means about 5% across the board cuts to federal dollars. For us, that means about $5,000. So not a big issue, but $5,000 is $5,000. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question before? I just, the negotiate, or Professional Negotiations Act, didn't mm -hmm. it have a provision that related to our new um, teacher evaluation? The, the entire reason that the KASB made that a priority was to get that part removed that board should not have to negotiate uh, teacher evaluation procedures because it's required to change them. So, but that never went through to change that. So it's still a part of the negotiated yes. contract. So when we put in our new system here, we will mm -hmm. need to negotiate that with the teachers with the expectation mm -hmm. that they give something or, or well, there's some we've had right? the committee uh, part of negotiations last year was uh, if we're going to change our teacher evaluation tool let's have a committee and let's all make a decision together so teachers have been a part of that <coughs> process it's still subject to negotiations but the understanding is we work through it in a committee already 
Uh, this ought to be what we go with. Uh, elections, there's been some effort to move those uh, local elections to the fall uh, and make them partisan, where school board members and city council uh, members would have to declare a party. Um, uh, that has kind of fallen by the wayside, so they moved it to, uh, let's do it in fall uh, of, of odd years, so we're not uh, following the federal elections. So it would be an off year, then it wouldn't have to be partisan. Board members would take office in January 1 in the middle of the year. It creates some problems. Uh, not an ideal situation. So why would we do that? To save money. Uh, I don't know if it's the, the billions of dollars that our governor saved us, but uh, it might save some dollars. <coughs> There's a Read to Succeed Act uh, that the governor was working on to, uh, if a student in third grade did not pass the reading assessment, they had to be held back, uh, which uh, there was a lot of pushback on, let's just let local, uh, local boards of education and administrators and parents make that decision. Uh, but the governor has a lot of pull, so he still got something through, but they moved it to first grade. Uh, and there's a lot of exceptions. So if the superintendent and the principal and the parent agree, we can just move the kid on. Uh, so, so really, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it anyway. Um, also, with first grade, there is no state assessment test. So how do we test the kid at that level? We have to make up the test. So. Uh, it's still there. Um, it's something we'll have to work through uh, if they ultimately pass it. The Activities Association, you may have heard about uh, the State Activities Association. There was a push to add parents or non-educators, non, uh, people who are not employed by the school district, to the executive governance of the Activities Association. Um, there's a lot of elected representatives board members, a part of that governing board already. Uh, a lot of this comes back to parents not getting their way and they didn't get their way with the appeals board and the, uh, the way the governance structure is. So we need to have more say. And for a lot of folks, a lot of legislators, it's hard to argue with the fact that, well, isn't more people involved? Isn't that a, a, a good thing? Um, uh, but I think the point is that it is set up and it's worked well. Um, we will have to, uh, if this passes, it's passed the House already, and yeah, it's going to the Senate. Uh, a non-educator would also have to be on our lead board of directors. So in addition to Mr. Bergen going, uh, this board would need to appoint somebody who's not employed with the school district to go to the monthly meetings and be involved in those uh, those decisions and uh, make sure you have a say in where the music festival is held and uh, how long the art festival is and some of those things. So, uh, so there's your legislative update. Uh, any questions on that? Any of that information? Questions or comments? Thank you. Move on to executive session uh, for personnel and negotiations. And how much time do we need? Um, say 20 minutes to start with. 20 minutes and include the principles. <coughs> President, I move we um, go into executive session for a period of 20 minutes to discuss confidential personnel matters. And negotiations. Then move second and go into executive session for 20 minutes to discuss personnel negotiations with administration. All three administrators. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign, 7 0. We're uh, closing business items now.
designation and contracts. I uh, need a motion to terminate the employment of J.D. Webb as a custodian, effective immediately. Mr. President, I move we accept her employment with Terminate, terminate J.D. Webb immediately. Second. They move second to terminate the employment of J.D. Webb as custodian immediately. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign. 7 0. Uh, we invite a motion to accept the resignation of uh, Andrea Saylor Seekies as a National Honor Society sponsor for next year. I'll make that motion. Second. Move and second to accept um, Mrs. Skeetsy's resignation from the National Honor Society sponsor. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Throw the same sign. Seven up. Yeah. All right. The uh, future agenda items. Uh, yeah, our uh, review. Uh, Bill Sailors will be here. Again, and uh, I should have more information for you on our preschool situation. Okay. And uh, budget, insurance, I don't know, a lot more. Thanks for attending. And, and for the okay. Move and second to adjourn. All in favor, please leave.